welcome everyone. I'm Norman Walberger, an Associate Professor at the University of New South Wales, and this is the first video in a new series which attempts to explain elementary mathematics to a very broad audience. The official name of this new series is Elementary Mathematics Explained. The short name for it is LM Math. This series is designed for people who have struggled with mathematics, who have never learned mathematics to their satisfaction, who perhaps hated mathematics when they were learning it in school. It's designed for people who would like to learn mathematics properly, but would like to start from the beginning, from the elementary mathematics that you learn from kindergarten to year six. The approach that we're going to take in this course is not to follow a curriculum kindergarten, year one, year two, and so on. Rather, I'm going to try to explain the subject in a rather broad way to a mature person who's willing to learn, who's willing to concentrate, who's willing to do the exercises that I'm going to suggest. So if that's you, let's start on a big adventure to learn mathematics and to really enjoy this beautiful subject, this most beautiful of all subjects. We're going to keep this definition of mathematics in our minds, that mathematics is common sense, precise use of language, and logical reasoning applied to the study of patterns and problem solving. The study of patterns that's kind of the theoretical side of the mathematics, the pure side of mathematics. Problem solving, that's the applied side, the practical side. So the key ingredients are common sense, just being reasonable. Precise use of language, we're going to be fussy about terminology, about the use of words. And logical reasoning, we're going to be careful about our thinking. Now, for a broader introduction to this series, more motivation and explanation, you can have a look at the video LM Math Zero, which gives an introduction to the series. Today, we're going to start with the two most important and fundamental branches of mathematics, which are arithmetic and geometry. So we're going to start doing a little bit of arithmetic by starting with basic counting. And we're going to start to do some basic geometry by investigating what I call the grid plane, which is a very concrete, down-to-earth, no-nonsense way of introducing geometry for those who are not familiar with it. So without any more ado, let's get into it. Let's start learning elementary mathematics. So we want to introduce geometry, very elementary, basic geometry. And we're going to do that not by going back to Euclidean geometry, as developed by Euclid 300 years before Christ, but rather to the geometry that was introduced in the 1600s by two Frenchmen, Fermat and Descartes. Descartes initiated what's now called the Cartesian Revolution in geometry, where we change our emphasis from a, an empty page to a page with structure on it. This is represented by a piece of graph paper, which is going to be a very important tool for us to do mathematics. Now, here is a book, a book that has graph paper in it, and I strongly urge you to get something like this. It's got a lot of scribbling, of course, but you can see here, for example, this is a sheet of graph paper. I'll give you a close-up look. All right, Just a sheet of graph paper, that's all it is, but it's a very nice structured place to do mathematics because as we'll see there's a lot that we can do in terms of arithmetic, in terms of geometry, just working in this grid plane. It's very easy and pleasant for students to use too. Now this is a rather fine grid book. The squares are five millimeter squares. They don't have to be that small. Right? It's very possible to get graph paper with, with slightly larger uh, squares, and that's fine too. 
the actual size of the squares is not so important. Okay, what's important is that we have equally spaced horizontal lines, they're all parallel, equally spaced vertical lines, they're also all parallel. Our lines are always straight. And the lines meet or intersect at points, which we'll call grid points. So each of these intersections or meets of a vertical and a horizontal line is what we'll call a grid point. Another word for grid point that we'll sometimes use is the word node. So a node is just a place where a horizontal and a vertical line meet. Now if you look at this piece of graph paper, you might see a whole bunch of horizontal and vertical lines, but you might also see something different. You might see it as a whole bunch of little squares all packed together nicely in rows and columns, forming this two-dimensional tiling, sort of like a bathroom floor or a wall. And that's good. So we can think about these little squares that appear. They're also important. We'll give them some names. So we'll say that one of these little squares, say like this one here, is a unit square. We'll use that terminology to talk about a little square formed by two adjacent vertical and horizontal lines. Another terminology for unit squares that we'll use is the word cell. It's a little bit shorter than unit square. So we'll say that this is a cell of the graph paper. There are lots of cells. There's another one there, there's another one there, there's another one there, and so on. Sort of parallel to that, suppose we have a line, say this line here, then the vertical lines separate this line into lots of little pieces. Such a little piece, like this one right here, will also give a name to that. We'll say that that's a unit segment. Unit segment. And we'll give a shorter name for that. Let's introduce the word bars to represent a unit segment. So along this line here, we see lots of bars from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, and so on. But that also applies to vertical lines. So from here to here, that's a bar. From here to here, that's a bar. From here to here, that's a bar. So we can see that we're starting off here by discussing the meanings of words. In mathematics, we want to be very precise about the meanings of words. And if you haven't done mathematics before for a while, this will be a kind of a novel thing for you. The idea that we have to be very precise about what words mean. In ordinary life, the meanings of words is a little bit cloudy. It's usually fuzzy around the edges. So, for example, if I ask you what a dog is, you will say something like, well, it's a, a small animal that has four legs and barks, and you will give some other attributes of it. And your description may be fine for the majority of dogs, but perhaps if you're talking about whether is, whether is a wolf a dog or, or is, a, is a leopard a dog, you know, um, there may be some ambiguity around the edges. And that's natural in our everyday world. Things just don't usually come with very precise definitions. But in mathematics, they do. And so that's a feature of the subject that you have to get used to. That we are going to pin down what we mean by our basic terminology, and we're going to try to be consistent about the use of that terminology as we go through. So it's important for you to become familiar with all the terms that I've underlined here, to be aware that we're using these words in a mathematical context here in a rather precise and focused way. A very common source of difficulty for people who are learning mathematics for the first time is that, in fact, most mathematics has a lot of unstated assumptions built into it. Certain conventions that are used by the practitioners that are often not made explicit. And unless you know these things in one way or another, either by having been shown them or, or deducing them yourself after being exposed to them for a while, it can be confusing. So let's have a look at some possible ambiguities that that previous page didn't cover. 
you very well may have some questions about the definitions that I was talking about in the previous page. And let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about them. So here are some assumptions or conventions that we're going to assume about this grid plane scenario that we're talking about. First of all, we're going to assume that the grid plane is extendable in all four directions. So although your sheet of graph paper that you may have in front of you actually has a boundary, that boundary is not really an essential part of the story. We're going to suppose that, if necessary, you can extend the lines. So for example, if we wanted to, we could extend this line, this line, this line. We could introduce some more vertical lines in this direction so that the grid plane starts extending in this direction. We can extend our picture. Not just in this direction, but also down to the right, up as well. So in our mind, we kind of think of this grid plane as being sort of unending. It goes off in all, in all directions, and who's to say exactly how far it goes? By the way, that's the approach that Euclid took to his geometry. He didn't really say that it goes off to infinity or anything like that. We're not talking necessarily about an infinite piece of paper, but we're just saying that we agree that we can, if necessary, extend our picture in any one direction. So that's an assumption or a convention that we'll agree to. Another is that these lines, these equally spaced lines uh, that I've been drawing are, first of all, parallel. I've mentioned that before. So these lines here are parallel means that they don't meet, even if you extended them. But they're also perpendicular. So we agree that the horizontal lines and the vertical lines are perpendicular. What does perpendicular mean? Well, at this point, that's not so easy to say, actually. It's easy to give lots of examples of things which are perpendicular. For example, the boundaries of this sheet of paper are perpendicular. They form a kind of a T-junction. Or sometimes, in a, the terminology, right angles is used. Okay? This is not perpendicular, this is not perpendicular, but this is perpendicular. Euclid said something like, the two lines lie evenly between each other. Okay, sort of expressing the fact that this line is somehow in between this line. Although it's a little bit vague, I admit. So we're not going to say exactly what perpendicularity means, but we are going to try to draw our grid plane in the same way that you find it on a book, with these vertical lines and the horizontal lines being, in fact, perpendicular. Another assumption is that the lines themselves are of negligible thickness. So although I actually draw them with some thickness so that you can see them, that thickness is not an essential part of the lines. In, in theory, the lines are very, very thin. And that also goes for points. So although I try to make a point rather big, for example, so that you can see it, in your mind the point should actually be just a little very, very small dot, where these very, very thin lines meet. Another assumption is that when we're talking about a bar, for example, this one here, we're going to include the endpoints. So this bar here, okay, it goes from this point to this point. We said that was a bar or a unit segment, I hope you remember. We're going to include the endpoints. So if someone asks us, is that red dot there, part of the bar? The answer is yes. And so is that grid point there. In a similar way, if we're talking about unit squares or cells, like this one here, then the sides of that cell are four bars. There, 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 and there. And we're going to include those four bars as being part of the cell. And in fact, also, there are these four corners they are also part of the cell. Another assumption is that you know what horizontal means. Horizontal is something like this. And that can be described in a number of ways. It can be described as sort of being a line that goes from left to right. That's the left direction, that's the right direction. Or sometimes we like to think of it in terms of points on a compass. North, east, south, 
west. So we could say that a horizontal line is a line that runs from west to east or east to west. Similarly, a vertical line, like this one here, is one that's going up and down. This being the up direction, this being the down direction. Or another way, in terms of the points of the compass, it's a north-south line. It runs from north to south or from south to north. There are, in fact, lots of other little conventions uh, floating around, and you may have some questions about them. For example, you might ask, oh, the grid plane that you drew, Norman, it was black. Does a grid plane always have to be black? The answer is, no, it doesn't have to be. In fact, I'm going to try to draw most of my grid planes black, just to be somewhat consistent, but that's not really an essential feature. Another question is, do the grid planes always have to be the same size? The next grid plane that I draw, can it have squares which are uh, considerably smaller? And the answer is yes. We're not that concerned about the actual size of the squares. They don't have to be exactly that size. It's important that all these squares have the same size, but if you have a different grid plane with a different scale, that's still the same kind of grid plane. We're still talking about the same thing mathematically, even though it may look physically different. If you have any other questions about conventions, about things that I seem to be assuming without saying so precisely, by all means, just write a little question on the comments for any video, and I'll try to clarify what's going on. So let's assume that you've ingested those definitions. Now let's carry on and add a few more. We're talking about segments and rectangles. There's our grid plane again. Let's consider a particular line. Let's say that line there. Okay. We've already talked about a unit segment, which is the part of the line between two sort of adjacent or nearby points on the line. We can generalize that a little bit and talk about a more general segment. We say that any two points on a line determine a segment, which is the part of the line between the points. What are we saying there? We're saying that any line, say this one here, if it has two points on it, namely this one and this one, then those two points determine a segment. The segment is the part of the line between this point and this point. And the points that we're talking about are grid points. I don't always say that, but for now all points are grid points. So these are places where the given line meets two vertical lines. And the part of the line between them is called a segment. There it is there. It doesn't have to be horizontal. Here's a vertical line. And from here to here, that's a segment of that vertical line. Now there's a kind of two-dimensional version of that called a rectangle. So what is a rectangle? Well, it's what you get when you have two horizontal lines. Let's say this line and this line together with two vertical lines. Say this line and this line. So we have four lines all together. This one and this one and this one and this one. And those four lines cut out from the plane what we call a rectangle. So it's this green shaded area right here whose boundary are these four segments. And we'll sometimes say that those four segments are the sides of the rectangle. They're segments. And it also has four corners. These are these points which are the endpoints of the segment. So a segment like this has two endpoints. This segment has these two endpoints. This segment has these two endpoints. This segment has these two endpoints. And that rectangle, we say it has these four sides and these four corners. Here's another example of a rectangle right here, formed by these two horizontal lines and these two vertical lines. There it is right there. It also has four sides, which are segments. That segment, that segment, that segment, and that segment. And it has four corners, that one, that one, that one and that one. So we have this one-dimensional idea of a segment, 
And I emphasize that the endpoints of the segment have to be grid points. And we have this two-dimensional idea of a rectangle. And the sides of the rectangle have to be vertical or horizontal lines. And the corners of the rectangle are also grid points. So, so far we've introduced this grid plane. And we've introduced some notions of objects in the grid plane. We've talked about lines. We've talked about grid points or nodes. We've talked about cells or unit squares. We've talked about rectangles and segments. Those are all different types of objects found within this little world of the grid plane. Now let's talk about notation. What we want to do is we want to be able to describe particular points or particular lines or particular rectangles. And we want to give particular rectangles names. So for example, just like if you have lots of pets, you might have lots of dogs and lots of cats and some horses. Uh, so those are the different types of animals that you have. But then you perhaps also want to give your dogs individual names. So well, that's the dog Fifi and that's Rover and so on. Uh, well, that, that horse is Roger, or that horse is Black Caviar, or whatever. So, notation. Here's our little grid plane. We've got a number of things in it illustrating the ideas that we've already talked about. And now we're going to introduce some notation or typical names for points, lines, segments, and rectangles. And somewhat arbitrarily, we're going to introduce some conventions that we're going to try to call points names given by capital letters, like capital A, capital B, capital C, generally from the first part of the alphabet. So, for example, that point there, its name is A. This point is B. There's C, there's D, there's E, there's F. And you can see the usefulness of that. If I want to talk about various places, I can talk not just about that point, but I can say to you, consider the point A. You can see what I'm talking about without me having to point to it. So points are in capital letters. Lines are in small letters. And typically L, M, N, letters roughly from the middle of the alphabet. So in this case here, this line here, you can see its name is L. While this line here, its name happens to be M. This line doesn't have a name right now. We could give it a name, but we haven't yet. Segments. Where's a segment in our picture? Well, here's a segment. The segment that we're calling S. It's going from A to B. So a typical name for a segment will be also a small letter. S, R, T, a letter roughly in that range of the alphabet. And finally, let's talk about rectangles. So there's only one rectangle in this picture, this one right here. And we'll typically give rectangles names with capital letters. And we'll generally choose the, the letters to be from the end of the alphabet. For example, X, Y, or Z. This rectangle here, its name happens to be X. Now, this is a guide only. This is not uh, an ironclad convention. It's only a guide. You can obviously see that if our diagram is very complicated, we're going to run out of letters because there are only 26 letters, 26 small ones, 26 big ones. So we may have to be flexible about these general conventions. So, for example, if we have lots of points, well, eventually we're going to get getting into that range. Okay, so this is a guide only, just to give you uh, a general orientation. Okay, you say, but if you've already got names for points, you could use those names for points to, say, name other objects. For example, this segment that we're calling S, it could also be described as the segment between the points A and B. And that's a very good point. So there's an alternate kind of notation that we're going to use. So for example, the segment S will also be written as AB with a bar over it. The bar over it means that we're talking about something between A and B. If we don't have the bar over it, just AB, then we'll agree that that means the entire line 
formed by A and B. The line that we were calling L. So this line here has now two different names to it. One is the, the original name that we gave to it, like M. And another name for it might be the line AC. In fact, we could also choose CD. That would also be a description of that same line. Or DA or AD. So there's lots of different possible ways of naming a line using this kind of convention. So to give some more examples of that, here in this rectangle it has sides, this segment, this segment, this segment, and this segment. I've given those segments names. This is R, this is T, this is U, this is V. So over here, let's just check that R actually equals the segment from C to D. That's correct. And that's the same as the segment from D to C. We don't mind which order those two points are taken. T is the segment from F to C, or from C to F. U is the segment EF, and V is the segment DE. Finally, let's have a look at rectangles. Say this rectangle X right up here. Another name for it, we'll agree, is to specify the four corners. Because knowing the four corners of a rectangle tells you what the rectangle is. So this rectangle is also the rectangle CDEF. There, with a bar over it again to tell you that you're talking about the stuff that's sort of inside those four points. And we'll agree that we're going to go around the rectangle like an ant walking around it. So we're going to go C, D, E, F. We're not going to go C, D, F, E. We have to go consistently around the outside, either in that direction or in this direction. Does it matter which corner we start from? No, it doesn't. We'll agree that it doesn't matter. So the same rectangle can be described by F, E, D, C. F, E, D, C. Those are the four corners. But there's another way of thinking about how to specify a rectangle. This same rectangle is also determined if you know two of its sides, a vertical side and a horizontal side. So we could also say that x is equal to rt. rt, that segment, that segment, with a bar over it representing that's the stuff inside the shape formed by r and t. We don't need to use r and t, we could also use u and t because those two sides also determine the same rectangle or for that matter, V and U. So alternate ways of using notation to describe a rectangle. Now let's introduce the idea of the length and the area of segments and rectangles. So the length of a segment S is the number of unit segments it contains. And this number will be denoted by S with two bars on either side. So this is our notation for the length of the segment S. So for example, this particular one here, this is S, it has length 1, 2, 3, because inside it there's that unit segment, that unit segment, that unit segment. 1, 2, 3. So its length is 3. This segment here, R, has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 unit segments, or 5 bars in it. So its length is 5. This segment right here, T, it's only one unit segment itself, so its length is 1. A two-dimensional version of that applies to rectangles. So for rectangles, we want to count how many unit squares or cells it contains. That's called the area of the rectangle. If we have a general rectangle X, then its area is denoted X with, again, two bars on either side. So the area of this rectangle X is 1, 2, 3, because there are three cells inside. 
the area of y is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Well, the area of z here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the area of x is 3, the area of y is 8, the area of z equals 5. These two rectangles here are a little bit special because they're only extending in one direction. This is a row. All the unit squares are lined up in a row. Here we call this a column because all the unit squares are lined up sort of vertically on top of each other. So a row rectangle extending horizontally, a column rectangle extending vertically, each only one segment wide. That brings us to the idea of the dimensions of a rectangle. If we have a rectangle like this one here, y, then we could ask, well, how many rows does it have? How many columns does it have? So this one has two rows and one, two, three, four columns. And those two numbers are called the dimensions of the rectangle. So officially, a rectangle x has dimensions m by n if it has m rows and n columns. So this rectangle x here, it's a 3 by 1 rectangle. y is a 2 by 4 rectangle. z is a 1 by 5 rectangle. So we measure how high it is, how many rows first, and then how wide it is, how many columns it has second. That notation for the dimensions of a rectangle can be a little bit confusing because it's easy to get mixed up with multiplication of numbers. So here's a, another alternate notation for the dimension which is a little bit less ambiguous. So we'll say that an alternate notation is dimension of x equals mn. That means the same thing as x has m rows and n columns. In other words, the same as saying that it's an m by n rectangle. So, for example, this one here, the rectangle y, and now I'm uh, kind of extracting it from the grid plane and just showing you the rectangle itself without showing you the grid plane that it comes from. Okay, it's got two rows. It's got five columns. So it's a 2 by 5 rectangle, that's one way of saying it. Or another way of saying it is that the dimensions of y are 2 and 5. What about the area of y? The area of y is the number of cells it contains, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So the area of y is 10. Here's another example. This rectangle here, it's the rectangle Z, let's say, then it has three rows and four columns. So it's a three by four rectangle. Three rows, four columns. Or another way of saying that is that the dimensions of Z are three, four. And what is the area of Z? It is, let's count, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 cells inside this rectangle, so its area is 12. Now, notice also that I'm moving um, from showing you the complete rectangle. So here I included the sides in blue. I also included the corners. Well, that's too much work to do in general. So generally, I'll just write a rectangle like this, showing you the various lines that appear inside it and on the boundary. These two examples certainly suggest that if you know the dimensions, then you can calculate the area just by multiplying. This is a 2 by 5 rectangle and its area happens to be 10, which is 2 times 5. This is a 3 by 4 rectangle, and its area happens to be 12, which is 3 times 4. Is that going to be generally true, do you think? It's something to think about. So let's uh, go up 
say, let's suppose we have uh, another rectangle x, and suppose its dimensions are 7 and 9. So in other words, that's a 7 by 9 rectangle. Is it going to be true that the area of that is 7 times 9, which is 63? So I hope you all know that 7 times 9 is 63, but there will probably be some of you for whom that's um, perhaps not so clear fact. You would usually use a calculator to figure out that kind of product. Okay, we're going to fix that. That's a big deficiency if that's uh, your case. But we're, don't worry, we're going to fix that. We're going to talk about multiplication later on in great detail, and you're going to learn multiplication properly. But at this point here, I just want to alert you to the fact that, that there might be a very strong connection between the dimensions of the rectangle and the area, and that what's involved here is this operation of multiplication. And you can kind of think, if, if you can see, are you absolutely sure that this thing is going to have area 63 even without drawing a picture and actually doing the counting? So in this first lecture so far, we've spent quite a lot of time on terminology and notation. Mathematics is not always about that, okay? Most of the time it's actually more about ideas that you use built up from the terminology and notation. But I want you to appreciate that it's important to get that terminology and notation straight at the beginning. That's the starting point, and then if we have a good solid foundation, we understand what the words mean, it makes it so much easier then to put ideas into place using those concepts. So now we're going to take the geometry, the geometrical setup that we've been talking about, and start looking at it from an arithmetical point of view. We're going to do some more counting. We've already done a little bit of counting, counting dimensions, counting areas, but there are lots of other interesting things that we can count for our rectangle. So I'm going to give you some, uh, some examples of things to count, and we're going to now start having a little bit of fun here. And we're going to have fun with these three rectangles. Okay, this is the rectangle Y that we've already talked about. It's 2 by 5. And notice that I've drawn that without a ruler. That's just a freehand drawing, so I hope you'll forgive me for that. Here is the rectangle Z. Its dimensions are 3 by 4. We've already talked about it. And here's a new rectangle. It's called a W. Its dimensions are 5 by 3. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Its area is 15, which should not be a big surprise, I hope, to you. Okay, so the first new thing that we're going to count is the number of points inside a rectangle. What do we mean by that? Well, let's have a look at this rectangle Y. There are points inside it. And by point, I mean grid point or nodes. So that's a point, that's a point, that's a point. How many of them are there? Let's count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. 18 grid points has Y. Notice I'm counting reasonably consistently. I've decided to go along this row, and then along this row here, and then along this row here. Let's count for Z. There's a grid point. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So that has 20 grid points. How many does W have? Well, that's your first exercise. Okay, in this course, there's going to be things for you to do. And it's important that you try to do them. This is the first one. It's not so hard. I'm sure you will be able to, to do it. But I want you to actually count the points in W. And uh, may I suggest that you keep a separate little notebook of exercises for this course where you attempt to do the various exercises. So it's probably a good idea to have two notebooks, one that briefly summarizes the main points of the lectures, and another that gives you a place to attempt the exercises. Our second thing that we're going to count is 
rectangles inside our rectangle. We're going to look at two by two sub-rectangles. What do I mean by that? Well, inside, say, this rectangle Y, we can find lots of little two by two rectangles. For example, right here, that's a two by two rectangle that's inside Y. But it's not the only one. There's also this one. And there's also this one. And there's also this one. So altogether, there are four such two by two sub rectangles of Y. How about for a Z? Let's count them for Z. Okay, let's try to be sort of consistent. So there's one two by two. There's another 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 one. There's another one for a total of six. And your second exercise, exercise 1.2, is how many two by two sub rectangles are there for W? So count them. And you can also, if you feel like it, think about what's the general pattern here. If I gave you a bigger rectangle, could you compute relatively simply the number of points? Could you compute relatively simply the number of 2 by 2 sub-rectangles? Is there a way of doing this without actually counting them? Our third example of things that we're going to count are paths. We can think of the unit squares or the cells inside the rectangle as being places where you can walk. And so let's consider a path that goes from the southwest cell to the northeast cell. So here's the southwest cell. Remember south is sort of down and uh, west is to the, to the left. So that's the southwest cell. And north is up and east is to the right. So that's the northeast cell. So I'm interested in paths that go from here to here, but whose steps are always either in the north direction or in the east direction. So you're allowed to either go right or you're allowed to go up. So for example, here's an allowed path. You start here and you go here, because that's going east, then you go east again, then go north, east, and east. That's an acceptable path, and that's one of the paths that we would like to count. So the question is, how many paths are there, how many different ways are there of getting from here to here by this kind of north-east jogging path? And the answer is five, and I'm going to show them to you. Okay. So I'm not going to start with this one, I'm going to start rather uh, like this. Let's start by going here and then across. That's the first path. Okay, let me give you that path again. Here it is, the starting point, and then here, 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 here. That's path number one. Okay, path number two is this one. Here, 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 here. Path number three, that's the path that's already labeled. Path number four, and path number five. There are no other paths where you're moving only north or east from here to here. For example, this is not allowed. Going here, 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 and then back, 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 you know, this kind of circling thing, not allowed. You have to only go in this direction or in this direction. How about for our rectangle Z? How many paths are there from this southwest cell to this northeast cell moving north or east? There are 10. So let me show you what the 10 are. Okay. So here's number one. Here's number two. Here's number three. Here's number four. Here's number five. Number six. Number seven, number eight, number nine, and number ten. So think about 
those 10 paths. Think if there's some kind of sort of systematic pattern and then exercise 1.3, apply it to counting the paths in W from the southwest cell to the northeast cell. How many paths are there from going from here to here? Okay. So this doesn't require any previous mathematics. You just have to understand what the question is and then you have to get out a piece of paper and do some experimentation. Draw some different paths. Try to get all the paths organized in a systematic way so that you're not missing any and so that you're not duplicating any. Okay. So you have to be a little bit organized. Being neat is probably good. Being systematic and being willing to use pen and paper. So those are all very important attributes of a successful student in mathematics. Being organized, being neat, being willing to put pen to paper. So I hope you'll adopt those and get to work on these exercises. But we have a few more too. All right, we'll stick with our three rectangles that we're looking at. Y, which is two by five, Z, which is three by four, and W, which is five by three. And I want to consider a few more counting problems which are a little bit more advanced, maybe a little bit more fun and interesting. The first is a tiling problem. Tiling means, just like when you're tiling a floor or tiling a wall, you want to fill the wall with tiles of a certain shape so that there are no gaps and no overlaps. Okay, you don't want the tiles to overlap and you don't want to leave gaps either. So we're interested in tiling one of these rectangles with particularly simple tiles with 1x2 or 2x1 rectangles. In other words, rectangles that look like dominoes. So here is a 1x2 rectangle. It's 1 in this direction, 2 in this direction. And here is a 2x1 domino. They're different shapes as far as we're concerned. The dimensions are different, even though, of course, as dominoes, they look much the same. And what are we interested in? We're interested in how many different ways are there of tiling this particular rectangle with dominoes. Forget about, forgetting about the actual numbers on the, on the dominoes and just thinking of them as rectangles, solid rectangles, either one by two or two by one. So here are the eight possibilities. Okay. So what does this mean? Well, it means that you're putting a domino sort of vertically right here, and then another one right here, another one right here, another one right here, another one right here. So you have five dominoes stacked together. They're all sort of uh, two by one dominoes, in fact. And if you sort of push them together, then you would tile this rectangle. You would fill it up completely, with no overlaps and no spaces. That's not the only way of doing it, so here's another way of doing it. We could put the first um, domino in sort of vertically, and then the next two uh, horizontally, and then the next two vertically. That would be another way of tiling this rectangle. And you can have a look to see if you agree with my uh, assessment. Here are eight different patterns. I think they're all different, and I think there's no other ways of tiling this two by five rectangle with dominoes. These are the only ways of doing it. There's exactly eight ways. So, your exercise, the next one, exercise 1.4, is to figure out how many ways we can tile this rectangle Z with one by two or two by one rectangles. So I want you to list a similar family of tilings for Z. It'll be a little bit more complicated perhaps because it looks like it's a little bit bigger. See how many different tilings you get. How about for W? Well, a little bit of thought shows that there are zero ways of tiling W. Why is that? Well, because the area of W is 15, which is an odd number. If you're going to tile with these two rectangles, they each have area 2. 
So the areas that you're going to be able to tile are 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, and so on, all the even numbers. You're never going to be able to tile a rectangle with an odd area because there will always be one square left over that's not covered. So the answer to this question is zero. Well, you're disappointed by that. You probably wanted to do something with W. So let's modify the question just a little bit. Let's snip out one of the squares. Let's remove this bottom cornered cell. So the one in the southeast position. So I've removed it right there. So we've got a new shape, which is no longer a rectangle. It's uh, some kind of, um, well, still a very pleasant shape, but it's not a rectangle. But we can ask, how many ways can we tile this shape, let's call it W star, with our dominoes? And that's exercise 1.5. And our final exercise for today is to have another look at this, this Y configuration and ask, well, what happens if we change the dimensions of y by just making it longer or shorter, but keeping it of height 2? So keeping two rows, but say having a 2 by 1, or 2 by 2, 2 by 3, 2 by 4, 2 by 5, 2 by 6, 2 by 7 rectangles. How many ways are there of tiling each one of those? So I want you to make separate computations. We've already done this one. We know the answer is 8. But we'd like to know what the answers for these ones are. And that's the last exercise for today. Once you have those answers, I want you to have a look at that sequence and see if you see anything interesting about it. So we're starting to do counting here. When primary school children are introduced to counting, they're usually introduced to counting everyday objects around them. They count the number of cars in the parking lot. They count the number of children sitting at their desk or the number of letters on a board or something. And that's all very well and good. So our approach to counting is a little bit different. We want to take examples of counting from mathematics itself. This is a general principle that I have, that often the most illustrative and most informative examples are not taken from real life situations. They're often taken from mathematics itself. That's what we've been doing here. I've introduced you to the geometry of the grid plane, and now we're looking at aspects of rectangles in the grid plane and doing counting in that context. So this has a, a twofold advantage. First of all, you learn about the other branch of mathematics even while you're learning about counting. So even though our main aim may be arithmetic, we're learning also about geometry at the same time. And secondly, these examples taken from mathematics are often quite interesting and informative and often fun. So there's a kind of a richness when you look for patterns within mathematics. So we're killing sort of two birds with one stone here with this approach to things. So that's our first lecture. You've got some work to do. Okay. I've covered quite a lot of territory here. We've done a lot of terminology, a lot of notation. We've covered introduction to the grid plane and various objects within it. So if necessary, don't be afraid of going over the video again to solidify your understanding of it. Right. You should spend several hours at least and several days on every video before you go to the next one. Next time we are going to carry on with rectangles and we're going to start connecting rectangles with arithmetic. Arithmetic with rectangles actually goes back to the ancient Greeks as well. So it's a very fruitful way of thinking about arithmetic, as we'll see. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Walberger. Thanks for listening.